All right, welcome in. We are live. Uh, the NC State Wolfpack are going to the Final Four improbably. Um, that's just that's just how they do it. That's how they do it in uh, Raleigh. Whenever they go to the Final Four, it's always an improbable run, apparently. Uh, Purdue is joining them. First trip for Purdue since 1980. First trip for NC State since 1983. First trip ever for Alabama. Uh, and then there's also UConn, who you may remember beat the shit out of everybody last year en route to a national championship. Um, I was busy right before we came on air going through all of these – these stats, these, I don't know how these people do this. Like the, the, the college basketball media just have, must have this stuff locked and loaded for in case NC state wins. Cause everyone's just firing off like stats about 11 seeds going to the final four. And, um, here's, here's Matt Norlander. I saw tweeted just, where's this one? Uh, every tournament since 2013 has had a five seed or worse, make the final four. We currently have two ones and a four NC state and his 11. Yeah. He tweeted that, um, today so there you go that's one little thing where it's like all right good job norlander doing your research i didn't realize that but every tournament since 13 we've had a five seat or worse that's crazy uh write that down for the manifesto next year by the way um what else i saw i, I was i was looking at something earlier oh uh fanta puts out the 11 seeds that have made the final four we've never had a seed worse than an 11 make the final four but at the same time we've now had six 11 seeds make the final four in history, which is apparently twice as much as a six seed. So the six seeds play the 11 seeds in the first round and 11 seeds. There've been six 11 seeds make a final four all time and only three six seeds is what someone says here. Um, yeah. Duke Duke lost uh, where I, I had another one. Then we can move on. Oh, Norlander had this one. Number four blue devils dropped by an 11 seed. It's the 15th time that Duke has lost in the tournament to a se team seated at least four spots lower that's the most in NCAA history. Arizona and Syracuse have twelve, and this was fifteen for Duke. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how these like everybody had these locked and loaded, which is awesome. It's that's they're doing their job, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know anybody like really expected NC State to to handle Duke that easily. I mean, at some point you assume that the Cinderella run's going to have to end, um, and NC State's going to come back down to earth. But DJ Burns is, is just not going to be denied. He is so fun. He has he has captivated the country. Um, I his his skills outrageous. I saw uh so so Golke came on mostly sports, and I asked him the other day before uh, NC State played Marquette. It was it was that yeah it was it was two days ago. Um, Friday is the word I'm looking for. Uh, I asked him his thoughts on this NC State team having gone to overtime with him, and Oakland was right there. And uh, you know like what do you think NC State has it in to make the run? And he mentioned that that DJ Burns was like a left-handed Jokic, and I didn't mean to say that that uh, Golki was wrong. It just like you know, I mean, that's a. I, I wondered like if Jokic heard that, how he would feel about it, and uh, you know, that's a that's a that's very high, very very high comparison to to say just because he's a big guy with a little bit of touch, a little bit of skill that he's that he's a Jokic. But you know, I, I asked Golki the question, that was his answer, and and we just accepted it and moved on. Uh, and then right before we sat down here, I saw a video of Jokic was apparently watching DJ Burns playing tonight and was commenting on on how skilled he was. And yeah, he's a fan now. So Jokic, DJ Burns has has captured the attention of Nikola Jokic. Um, twenty nine points for the big fella. He had only three assists, but it feels like more uh, because all of his assists just have a little bit of sauce on them, and they and it just feels like he's he's you know he's he's a, a point center out there. Um, Plays no defense really, but who cares? Uh, it, it's it's hysterical. He's 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 exactly what college basketball needs. Um, I I am worried, obviously, as we all should be, about the matchup with Zach Eady. Like, <laughs> Eady's going to absolutely kill DJ Burns. DJ Burns might foul out in the first five minutes of the game, um, or he just might stand there and just let Eady score every single time. But uh, the ride continues for NC State. It feels like it should be a fluke. It's not a fluke. Um, they are playing great basketball. They went three for 13 from the three-point line. That seems to be a theme. Other than Alabama, who hit 1,000 threes against Clemson, Purdue didn't shoot the ball well today. NC State didn't shoot the ball well today. UConn didn't shoot the ball well yesterday against Illinois. All three teams move on to the Final Four. Maybe maybe that's the theme of this Final Four, is you have three out of the four teams are due uh, to have a good shooting night because – yeah, all three of them shot pretty poorly, but uh, NC State is very, very fun. Um, they, I, I talked about it after the Marquette game that they're just Marquette kind of 
just shit down their leg in that game, and it was it was like weird to see them playing so poorly. But NC State is is has been playing in these win or go home situations for so long now that they're so used to the moment. They're so used to, uh, you know, they get down. I don't know what Duke's biggest lead was today. Maybe eight points or something. That's that's probably the biggest I remember. I don't know if it got to ten or not. Um, and they don't panic because they've been they've been in these spots before. They they really do have the team of destiny feel where like they just trust that like it's going to work out for them somehow. And on top of it, like the the, the real X's and O's reason they're so good is DJ Burns. DJ Horn is a bucket. He's he's very very hard to guard. But DJ Burns is such a unique talent. Um, it's not just that he's a big dude who can score. He can pass. He can put the ball on the floor. He's he's a he's a matchup nightmare, and uh, he he's been playing out of his mind. He's got such good touch. Um, he can turn and face. He's he's like a. He, I mean, I'm not the first to make this comparison, but I I think it is very apt that he's he's Zach Randolph. If, if uh, Zach Randolph was like 50 pounds heavier and and bigger and could throw his weight around even more than he did, and Zach Randolph could throw his weight around. Um, so yeah, shout out to NG State first Final Four. Since 1983, uh, same with Purdue, first Final Four since 1980. And uh, as a reminder, the the field expanded in 1985, so you could make an argument, like if you really wanted to. I don't know if it would be accurate, but there, there's there's something to be said about this being their first Final Four in the expanded field era because they've had to win more games. This is the first time they've ever won four games to make a Final Four. We'll put it that way. There's the first time in a 64-team bracket that either of these schools have advanced to a Final Four. Um, and now they're going to play each other on Saturday in Phoenix. Uh, the Duke side of things um, has to be disappointing. You you are the better team. You're, you're pretty heavily favored in this game. It's a team that you just lost to not too long ago. It's a conference foe that you know well. Uh, Filipowski had a, a – it, it felt like he had stretches where he was okay, but he was pretty bad the entire night. Um Tyrese Proctor was horrendous. I mean, he was – it looked like he was throwing the game at times. Jerry McCain was awesome. He, he was doing all he could to, to save the season for Duke. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is kind of what I was familiar with from Duke, which is what we've been saying all year about Duke. Like, the talent is there. They're loaded. But they just kind of are okay with going with the flow and letting other teams dictate the terms. And I felt like – I mean, this, this really I – don't, I don't know if Houston fans should be happier or if this makes them sadder seeing Duke lose like this because uh I really do feel like Houston if if Jamal Shedd doesn't go down like this is this to me is like further proof that Houston was going to impose their will in that game and uh they did not and Duke beat them and and Duke moved on but uh we we got to see it against NC State where even as Duke was was up and and McCain was hot early and and hit a couple threes and got fouled on another three and uh was feeling it a little bit um it did eventually, as as everyone settled down, it felt like a game that was played on, on NC State's terms, and uh, that's why they're moving on to the Final Four. That's why they, they won by 12, dude. That's, like, crazy. Duke gave up 55 points in the second half. Just a just an ugly, ugly game in the first half. NC State scores 21, and they scored 55 in the second half. That's crazy. Unbelievable. Filipowski fouls out. Um, hate it for him. They didn't storm the court, did they, in Dallas? He's okay. He's going to be fine. Um, he wasn't on the court anyway, though, at the end of the game. So he'll be. That's why he fouled out, was because he was, he he was seeing the frenzy from the yeah. Wolfpack fans, and he was like, "Fuck, dude, they're about to storm this court. I gotta, I gotta get out of this game." Um, yeah. So we're we're moving on to a Final Four where, uh, actually, let me talk about DraftKings, then we'll talk about Purdue because Purdue Tennessee was the game of the day, and and we should probably talk about that before we talk about the Final Four. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into one hundred and fifty dollars instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. If you're if you're buying this uh, NC State Cinderella run, want to put a little action on them to win two more. You can do that now with the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Uh, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code TITUS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code TITUS. The crown is yours. Um, yeah, so NC State, uh, DJ and DJ, it's the DJ and DJ show, but uh, all the all the role guys are, are incredible. Mo Diara, uh, Ramadan. What is – okay, so this is ignorance. Um, absolute ignorance. We're, we're all in the trust tree. We're all trying to figure this out together. Uh how long does Ramadan last? It's a is, month. So he's going to be dealing with this. No, he's not because the games are at night in the Final Four. Yeah, after sundown you can, you can eat. 
He can eat after sundown. So yeah. if NC State, but fuck, they're playing in Phoenix, dude. So the games are going to be earlier in Phoenix. Yeah. So NC State needs the second game badly, probably. Right. So he can eat something on the bench. Um, Ramadan, yeah. It ends on. Tuesday. It ends on Tuesday, April 9th. Damn. 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 Um, damn. <laughs> How many times did I say damn? Uh, so so. They need the second game badly. They need, NC State needs the second game badly so Diara could uh could be at full strength or like eat stuff on the bench and, and hydrate as he needs to against Purdue. Um I don't know. Now I'm now I need to start like studying solar calendars and sunsets and, and shit like that in Phoenix, Arizona. Cause I yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be thinking about this all night after I after we get done with the show. Uh Mo Diara though is he's been great through this tournament, uh grabbing rebounds. It was one for six today, but uh you know he he's he's been awesome throughout the tournament. O'Connell hits big shots for them when they need him. Morcel is is become like a, a mid range god um, at these, these he drives to the bucket, stops on a pop, and and you know either hits the shot or does like a little spin move and hits a fadeaway. He's gotten so good at those. Middlebrooks is so uh, we we were having a blast. I didn't realize it until they pointed out on the broadcast tonight that Danny Cannell is his uncle, and then uh, we were having a blast watching the game, just pointing out that he's like a. He's the exact type of player you would expect to be Danny Cannell's nephew. Um, he, he seems like a guy that Danny Cannell would be watching and wouldn't have any relation to and would absolutely love his game, so it works out perfectly that he's Danny Cannell's nephew. Um, just a just a gritty son of a bitch out there doing all the dirty work. Big-time glue guy. Uh, yeah, and, and I think uh, it, it's coming together for NC State, and the DJs are obviously getting all the headlines, but um, I think the role guys are stepping up and, and not trying to do too much and not uh, – you know, not not thinking that it's it's their time and and it's their moment, and they need to to you know seize seize the moment. They're they're perfectly fine with riding the DJ and DJ show and and picking their spots. They're playing great team defense. Um, it's been fun, and it and it does. I said it last night. It's I've been saying it the last couple of days. I guess I'm I'm losing track. These all these shows are blending together. But uh, the NC State run is is really testing my desire to want the best teams in the Final Four because I don't know how you can watch this team and watch. Uh, DJ Burns out there and watch how NC State is winning these games because it's not fluky. I mean, at this point, you beat Colorado, who I know is a 10 seed, but Colorado has has multiple first-round picks on that team. Uh, they have a guy who's an all-conference player and in, 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 uh, in, in Simpson as, as a third player. Um, Eddie Lampkin's a guy who's been – like, they, they have – Colorado's a very talented team. And uh, Marquette beat Colorado. I don't know why I'm talking about Colorado. They beat Texas Tech. That's what I was thinking of. Texas Tech can score the basketball. Texas Tech had a great season in the Big 12 play. Uh, NC State beats them. Then they beat Marquette. Um, they beat Oakland, obviously, but they beat Marquette. They beat Texas Tech, and they beat Duke. That was the point I'm trying to make, is that it's not like NC State has, has made it to this Final Four by the bracket just blowing wide open for them, and they're playing – a bunch of double digit seeds on their path. Um at this point they 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 ripped off three wins in the ACC ACC tournament against the three best teams in the ACC and and Carolina and Duke and Virginia. Um but now I guess NC State fans are saying not so fast. We we are the best team in the ACC. So we beat the second, third and fourth best teams in the ACC to win the ACC tournament. Um so yeah, it it a lot of times you get like an 11 seed or a a lower seed in the in the final four, it feels a little fluky. It feels like, you know, they're just a, a team that's that's captured lightning in a bottle and I don't mean to suggest that that that's not there's not a little bit of that going on with NC State but if this was the first time if you just started watching them play in the ACC tournament and through this whole run um yeah they've had some close calls Louisville's up on them at halftime that's probably not awesome you would you would if you if you would have uh, picked out a Final Four team I'm, I'm guessing these other three Final Four teams that they play Louisville they're not going to be trailing at halftime so like that's that's not great. You know, the, the they should have lost to Virginia. That's not great. Oakland takes them to overtime. There are moments where, uh, you know, you would have liked to see better basketball out of them, but you, the, the the run that they're on is undeniable, and uh, it's not like – it's not like it's gimmicky or bullshit or, or anything else. Like, I mean, they, they, they just handed Duke their ass tonight. They The second half, they just stepped on Duke's throat. They were the tougher team. They DJ Burns was absolutely unstoppable. John Shire had no answers for him. Um, and, and NC State moves on. And now you get the the impossible task of beating the Purdue Boilermakers in the Final Four. Is this Final Four, do, you, do we have spread for NC State-Purdue? Because we're going to have yes. two double-digit. Nope. No, not. Nine. Nine, okay. So we also have tip times. 
Who's who's uh, for NC State? Uh, six p.m. Game. Eastern. NC so State Purdue first game. That's the first game. Fuck, which is four p.m. Four p.m. Arizona time. time. Yeah, so the game will be over before sundown. That's bullshit. I would file an injunction if I was a if I was an NC State fan. That's bullshit. Uh, yeah, that sucks. But I guess it makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. UConn Alabama is the game that seems, but the spread's bigger. But the but I guess the sexiness of that matchup pops a little more than NC State Purdue. I guess I don't know. Um, I don't know how they go. I don't know how they pick. It's crazy that yesterday, UConn Illinois was the first game. It's crazy that Purdue Tennessee was the first game today because I felt like they had both of those flipped. Even though, you know, Bama Clemson ended up being a better game. I thought that was crazy yesterday that they. They did it that way, so who the hell knows? I don't know how they pick these these tip times. But uh, NC State marches on. They get to play Purdue. Let's talk about Purdue beating Tennessee. Uh, Zach Eady with an all-time game, 40 points, 16 rebounds, um, zero bench points from Purdue. Trey kaufman Wren only had two points uh, on an and one, and then he missed the free throw. And uh, Purdue got zero bench points. It was basically Zach Eady, a little bit of Braden Smith there for stretches, Fletcher loyal Fletcher lawyer for uh, another stretch, and then Lance Jones hit like one big three, uh, and, and otherwise it was Zach Eady versus Dalton Connect this entire game. I didn't think it was a good game, uh, which I'm I'm on an island about this. Everyone was like, well, "This was a this was an absolute classic. This was one of the greatest games." I mean, Purdue did not shoot the ball well at all. Um, there, it, it was Tennessee was just trying to to tackle Zach Eady every time he got the ball. It was exactly the type of Tennessee I mean they've already played this year and the, and the game was that way too it's it, this is how Tennessee plays um this is how teams play against Purdue it's a it's a parade to the free throw line it's physical as shit um and I felt like it was extremely disjointed but the individual brilliance of Dalton Connect and Zach Eady made it worthwhile made it um it, it was a fun battle in that regard. These are the two best players in college basketball all year. Zach Eady is going to win the National Player of the Year, all the National Player of the Year awards. But uh, if college basketball had a Heisman, um, Dalton Connect would be – it would basically just be like those two guys invited to the ceremony, I think. Like it's just basically – I don't really know who else – I mean, there, there are other – R.J. Davis had a great year and, and Terrence Shannon came on late, I guess. Like there are other guys to be excited about. But like it was it was Dalton Connect and Zach – Dalton Connect is always the only guy – that could win National Player of the Year from Zach Eady, and he was never particularly close to doing it. But uh, it made for a fun day today to have those two guys playing each other, one to go for 40, one to go for 37. Purdue moves on to the Final Four, as first reported on this show in October. I thought I said it earlier in that. Cody pulled the clip that it was it was October that I said Purdue was going to the Final Four. Um, as is tradition, uh, when I get one right, when I get one wrong, the haters – come out and they say you're a dumb fucking idiot and you got that wrong uh and when i get one right the haters always have a way tj of saying damn titus you called that and and i'm obviously kidding they don't do that they, they say the exact opposite and they point out that i actually picked tennessee to beat purdue in my bracket which is not my fault because liam blutman was in here to he was supposed to remind me not to do that um and he didn't but yeah, I, I this this was not a surprise to me at all. Um, some Purdue fans thought thought I was trying to jinx Purdue. Some I, I don't know. It just like it, it seemed it seemed obvious to me at the start of the season that Purdue was was destined to have a very special year. Um, again, you can go listen to like basically any preseason show I did where I was I was talking about this Purdue team. The Zach Eady is not going to get any smaller. Uh, Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer last year showed flashes, showed enough flashes that you could tell that eventually those two guys were going to be very, very, very good basketball players. I probably would have guessed it was going to happen next, like either their junior or senior year. Um, I don't know if I would have anticipated Braden Smith being this good this fast, uh, but it, it it made a ton of sense that Purdue would, would, go, would dominate this season, be as good as they are, and, and go to a Final Four for the first time since 1980 because – uh, they were they were one of the best teams in the country last year, and they, this year's team is last year's team except better. And and they've addressed a lot of the problems they had last year, namely the three point shooting, which is funny because they were three for fifteen from the three point line today. And Mason Gill Gillis, who I just got done saying I've never seen miss a three point shot in like the last month, it felt like uh, missed two wide open threes in this game, and it felt like that was what Tennessee needed to. Um, if Tennessee was going to have a chance to win this game, that's what you need. You need 
you need Purdue to not shoot threes particularly well, uh, and you need a favorable whistle as it as it pertains to Edie. Um, and they had the first. I mean, Purdue didn't shoot well at all. The second, they did not have. And uh, once again, they were they were uh, you know dealing with foul trouble all game, which is not a surprise at all. But it's still you know I if I was a Tennessee fan, I'd obviously be frustrated. But also like if you watch the game, I mean Tennessee was hacking the shit out of Purdue, and there is. Purdue fans will fight me on it, whatever. I'm just speaking my truth. There is the reality that, like, Edie initiates a ton of contact, and he fights for position, and he is very, very physical. And I think defenders get put in a put in a position where it's like the only way to guard him is to match his physicality, and then a lot of times they get frustrated because their physicality is a foul. His physicality is not a foul. They play the whole first half. Every single guy on the floor is fouling each other. It's just a total clusterfuck of a game, but the one guy who doesn't commit any fouls is the seven foot four, three hundred pound dude that's like tangled up with everybody every time down the floor on both sides. Um, so I understand Tennessee's frustration, but at the same time, they were fouling the shit out of him the entire game, uh, which is part of their game plan. Jonas Adu was terrible today. Uh, that that that's a bummer for Tennessee. He, he only played ten minutes because he um, wasn't playing particularly great defense. He kept falling into the trap of shooting these little mid range shots over Edie. Um, he was short on every single one, missed every single one, uh, fouled three times. Um, and he kind of got to a point, he was bobbling the ball. He was just, he was, he was very, very out of sorts for Tennessee. And it felt like once that, once like Rick Barnes identified that Jonas Adu just didn't have it today, uh, he, his hands are kind of tied and Estrella gave him great minutes. I, I felt like he was, um, guarding Edie better than anyone else on Tennessee's roster. And he's like their third string big guy. Uh, Awaka, you know, he fouls out in 14 minutes. Um, so yeah, it was, it was going to be a struggle to begin with because Edie is, is so good at drawing fouls. I mean, he's, he's very close. Um, who, who tweeted that? I saw someone's, I like, I want to give credit to people, but also I don't know how to look this shit back up. I just see it and then I move on and then I forget to write it down. Um, Edie's, Edie is knocking on the door of setting the record for most free throws in a season by any one player. I think it's like within reach and and we can assume that he's going to play two more games. No disrespect to NC state, but uh, you have to forgive me for assuming that Purdue is going to beat you guys. Um, So yeah, if he plays two more games, I think he was like 20 something free throws away and he's averaging almost 12 a game. He shot 22 free throws tonight. Um, Yeah. He's, he's on his way to, to, to setting the NCAA record for most free throws in a game. It was always going to be an uphill battle for Tennessee because of that, because that's that's what Zach Eady's game has become. Um, but, you know, there, there was a hope that, like, you would use your fouls wisely, and, like, you, you knew the guys were going to get in foul trouble, but it's like if, if Adu can give us 20-ish minutes and also provide a little bit of offense and also grab some rebounds um, and also free up guys with some screen, I don't know, just do a little bit more than just like play 10 minutes and foul three times and then go sit on the bench. And, and you know, that if, if that's all you're getting out of a do, if that's all you're getting out of a Waka, uh, is, is, is a foul out in 14 minutes. Um, I don't, I don't know how good Dalton, Dalton connect was, was otherworldly dude. And I'm going to miss him so much, but like, yeah, Dalton connect got a little cold down the stretch, but also like what the hell else could he have done? Um, Tennessee kind of had no answers defensively for, for Edie. And then Zakai Ziegler didn't have a great game either. That was a little bit of a bummer. Zakai Ziegler couldn't play in the tournament last year. Um, when I was when I was talking up this Tennessee team all season as being different, and I do think that going to the lead eight uh, for for just the second time I think in program history, I think 2010 they went to the lead eight, and then now I think those are the two times they've ever been to the lead eight. Um, I think that counts as as you know the final for a lot of people, Final Four is the only thing that counts is getting over the hump. But this this Tennessee team was very obviously different than the last few that, that Rick Barnes has had. The number one reason was obviously Dalton Connect and, and today was a great example why. Thirty seven points. Uh if he's not on that if he's not on the team this year and they just have like a replacement level dude in his spot, they lose by thirty and, and they they get zero offense out of anybody and it's it, it's just an absolute shit show from Tennessee. So that was the number one reason I was optimistic that Tennessee might be able to get over a hump this year. The other was that Kai Ziegler wasn't in the tournament last year, and uh, he was back, and he was throughout the season playing great for them. He's a great defender. Um, he usually can knock down wide open shots, and today he was just very, very off. And he was uh, missing wide open threes. He had those little bunnies around the rim that he was rushing, and and you know I, I assume that 
uh, you know, we saw it happen. I, I again, I think Zach Eady's a horrendous defender, and I think he's going to get exposed at the next level as being a horrendous defender. Um, but there are some things that he's good at, and and one of those is being like a. He's not a. I don't even think he's a great rim protector in the sense that like I don't really feel like he goes after shots. I feel like he lets shots come to them, and then when he does, he blocks them. But the one thing I do give him credit for is his presence intimidates the shit out of people when they get around the rim. And I, I, I said that against Gonzaga where it was clear that Gonzaga had drilled these short rolls over and over. You could tell the whole practice leading up to the, the Sweet 16 game that Gonzaga was telling their big guys, like, when you roll, just stop short, hit a little floater. Stop short, hit a little jump shot. Like, do not do not roll and jump into ED because that is, that is when he's good at defense. He's very good at – one-on-one -on -one post moves, which is what I'm worried about with DJ Burns, by the way. He's, he is good at you, you dump it into the guy, and, you, and it's a one-on-one -on -one situation where a guy has his back to the basket and he's trying to make a post move on Zach Eady. Zach Eady is very good at guarding those. Um, he's also very good at uh, basically like walling up drivers. If you're driving to the bucket and he's standing there, he, he's going to block your shot if you, if you try to jump into him. Um, but what I don't think he's good at is I don't think he's good at going after shots. I don't think he's got that like – uh, like Anthony Davis is, is the, the best example of that. Um, Greg Oden is, is another one that comes to mind to me for obvious reasons of uh, like shot blocking dudes that, um, you know, go at, go they're, they're standing under the basket. They're kind of trying to be this rim protector, but you tried to pull up for a little, for a little, you know, eight foot jump shot. I'm now going to go after that. And, and I'm now going to challenge that. And I'm going to block that shot that you didn't think that I could get to. Um, Edie doesn't really do that. And, uh, it, it felt like Gonzaga and then Zakai Ziegler today both either didn't fully realize that or they knew that but, like, didn't trust it in the moment. And there were so many times where they were, like, kind of open, like five feet away from the bucket, and they were rushing them. And, like, you know, um, if they just took their time and, like, just instead of looking out of the corner of your eye if, like, Edie's coming to block the shot, it's like, dude, you could have just, like, laid it in almost. Uh, but, yeah, it felt like Ziegler was in his head about Edie, and uh, that's not a coincidence. You know, Edie's a big a big dude. Zakai Ziegler's not, and uh, I'm sure that played into it. But, but Ziegler giving Tennessee a little bit of nothing on the offensive end was, was devastating to their chances as well. Um, but, yeah, I felt like this Tennessee team, uh, you know, I, they throughout the season um, they – the, the the idea of going to their first Final Four in program history felt like a reasonable goal. They ultimately did come up short against uh, against Purdue, but um, I do feel like I there were some I, there there are positive takeaways for the program for Rick Barnes. Now I understand that the country at large is going to point and laugh and say you still didn't get to a Final Four. This doesn't count. Uh, but I saw enough today um, that. I, I do think that, that this Tennessee team proved that they were a little bit different from the Tennessee teams of the past. Now, they obviously didn't prove that they are, are national title good, which is probably where their um, where their standard is set now and what their goals are. But, uh, yeah, Dalton, Dalton Connect was, was incredible. What a, what a cold-ass white boy performance from him, hitting six threes. Um, and, it, and, and it was the perfect situation. It was, it was him versus a number one seed. Uh, the second best team in the country, a team that might win the national championship. But by this time next week, we might be taught. Well, that wouldn't be true. By this time next week, it'll be. By this time in in eight days, well, that's not true either because the game will just kind of be tipping off in eight days. At this time in eight days and a few hours, uh, Purdue might be national champions, and he's going up against them and uh, just carrying Tennessee's offense. Um, and that is. That that's why I was so excited about him this year is because he is he he was put in a situation where it's like you're going to have to single handedly carry our offense and uh, he did it at different times throughout the year. There were other games where the rest of the guys were awesome, like the the Kentucky game at Rupp comes to mind where it felt like Tennessee's whole team was just humming offensively and and um, it wasn't a deal where they needed Connect to go for forty. Uh, but for the last the last. Uh, the last time we get to see Dalton connect playing for this Tennessee team to be against a, a player as good as Zach Eady against a team as good as Purdue. And for him to bring it to that level in a situation where no one else on his team was really doing anything offensively. Uh, I thought that was a perfect way to, for him to go out and it sucks that, that we're not going to see him on the final four stage, but you know, Purdue making it to the final four is the story and, and it's, it's probably a better story, all told. I mean, the the fact that two teams now have lost to 16 seeds and they've both turned around and and made it to the final four the next year. I don't know how you can uh, 
not be a little romantic about that. Um, now, as we forecast the, the road ahead in this Final Four, uh, obviously Purdue is going to be a heavy favorite. Obviously Connecticut is going to be a heavy favorite. It does feel like we're on a collision course uh, for UConn and Purdue to, to meet each other. I worry about DJ Burns against DD because I worry about everybody against DD, as you should. But um, defensively, it's going to be a very serious problem. Uh, I don't know if, if NC State – Excuse me, I have the burps. I don't know why I've been having the burps at night. This doesn't really happen to me, but it's been happening to me every time we do these shows, burping them up. Um, I don't I don't know if NC State has a zone that they're comfortable throwing out there. I don't know if they have I don't know I don't know what kind of shit they have that they can throw against the wall, but I feel like this might be a good time to to figure it out leading up to the the Purdue game, especially when you have a a basically a week of prep. Um they're going to have to figure some shit out. And uh, Tennessee didn't really double that much today. Uh, they got cooked for it. Edie scored 40 on them. Um, I do think that's the smarter approach. Uh, you're, but but to do that, you do need guys who can hold their own. And I don't mean stop Edie. I don't mean shut him down. I just mean, like, you need guys that can get stopped every so often. And Tennessee kind of had that with Estrella, crazy enough. Like, the the third-string guy that they – he's a freshman, right? I think Estrella's a freshman. Um yeah, they're they're freshmen. They're freshmen that they, is like their third string big dude. They bring off the bench, and he only played fifteen minutes. And Edie, you know, scored plenty on him. But uh, every so often, he would he would get a stop, and and he was providing enough that I felt like Rick Barnes was comfortable with leaving him in these one on one situations. Because if you double, if you if you bring predictable doubles on Zach Edie, um, it's lights out because Purdue shooters are so good now. Uh, they didn't shoot it well today, but I, I don't think that's a winning strategy if you're NC State. And I don't – DJ Burns is is not going to be able to guard Zachy. I mean, DJ Burns might not be able to guard me in the low block, to be completely honest. I love the guy. I'm just being realistic, and I'm trying to help NC State here, try to figure out a way to pull off the upset. Uh, if you're throwing DJ Burns out there and you're saying, please guard him, I'm not sure I really love that. So you say, well, what about Mo Diera? Uh I like that as a better idea. I don't love that this game is in the middle of the day. Don't love it. Don't love this Ramadan situation. I respect I respect it. I respect that he's a man of his principles. I'm not telling him to not do it. Uh, I would have just preferred the NCAA to give him a fighting chance and, and play this game after sundown. But I that, that is I, – I hate these matchups for – I hate NC State's roster for, to, for stopping Edie. I hate um, – they have been playing great defense. They've been, they've been guarding the three-point line well. Uh my fear is that NC State goes into this game saying, "We why why should we really have to change that much? Our defense is working for us. Uh, we have a good thing going. Let's just keep it rolling." Um, yeah, I, that's not smart. That that would not be a smart situ- that, that would not be a smart uh, smart thought. So, you know, I I, I I am a little bit worried about that. Uh, I I do. I'm buying into the the mystique and the the Cinderella story, and I do think that NC State has a lot of talent. I think DJ Burns is uh, he he's not just a back to the basket post move guy, even though he's got the spin moves and he's got the the touch around the rim. He can turn and face. He can cause a little bit of problems for Edie to guard. Um, so as much as I do think Edie's awesome at at one on one those one on one post situations where guys just kind of throw their they, they, guys just try to do to him what he does to them on the other end and it doesn't ever seem to work out well for for anybody that that does that to Zach Edie. Uh, I think DJ Burns can step out a little bit, uh, pull Edie away from the basket, and when he does, he's got enough of a handle and enough of a, a you know moves around the bucket to maybe create a little bit of offense uh, like he's been doing one-on-one. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think NC State, if they have any any shot in this game, they're going to have to get serious about um, throwing some shit against the wall on defense. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if we're throwing a 1-3-1 out there. I don't love that. Who was it that threw the – Utah State did. That's Utah State played like one possession of 1-3-1 against Purdue, and they just like threw it straight up to the rim, and Edie caught it and dunked it. And they were like, all right, well, fuck that. Maybe that's not going to work. Um so I don't I don't know what the answer is going to be for them, but if they if they go into that game and they say let's just guard them straight up and see what happens, um, you're going to see what happens and it's going to get ugly. So the only other alternative I think is they're going to have to start doubling, which obviously uh, you worry about with Purdue shooters. So they're going to have to get extremely creative about where the doubles come from. 
Um, you can still kind of fluster Edie a little bit. He's obviously gotten better. He's seen every type of double team at this point in his career that you could possibly see as a big man. But, uh, you know, Tennessee got lucky a handful of times in this game. Dalton Connect, there's one that comes to mind. It was it was one of Gillis's early misses. Dalton Connect doubles from the corner. He's guarding Gillis. Gillis, I don't remember if Gillis was the post feeder or not, but Gillis is on the ball side corner. Connect comes to double, just completely turns his back to Gillis. Maybe Gillis relocated. Maybe he was in the he was on the wing and then the ball goes in and he relocates to the corner. And Dalton Connect gets all turned around, kicks it back out to Gillis. He has a wide open three. If if NC State watches that tape and says, Oh, we can leave Mason Gillis open in the corner. Like like we we could just double from from the ball side and, and, and leave Gillis open. Uh yeah, that's not gonna work out. I don't think that's gonna work out and uh I don't think they should do that. So I think like if you are going to double, you're just gonna have to bring chaos from like the help side and zone up on the help side and um you know, just kind of scramble out of the if if E D throws it out of the double team, just kind of scramble to recover, but then you know the guards have gotten so good. I think I think last year, the guards would get a little gun shy. They 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 would get caught in between when those situations would happen. And and you know you bring a double. Edie throws it to the opposite wing, say, and it's Lawyer or it's Smith. Last year it felt like they would get a little spastic about it and be like, do I shoot? Do I drive? Fuck 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 fuck. And then like kind of like be caught in between and not really sure what to do. They're so much better and 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 so much more poised now that uh, you know that that's that's. That's a tougher. That's a tougher thing too. But they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to figure something out. So that's that's my on the fly preview of NC State Purdue. Um, I I think the way it, it it works for NC State is they they're they're going to have to win defensively because like their offense, their offense is good when DJ and DJ are going off. But yeah, I'm worried about the D, I'm worried about whether DJ Burns can keep this up against Edie. Um, so they're they're gonna just have to to muck it up and 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 play some great defense and I think the way they're gonna have to do that is is throwing some zone and throwing some bullshit out there and uh, and hoping that like mixing up looks does something to slow Purdue down but uh, yeah it's feeling like Purdue UConn is is kind of inevitable um, now we we've been in this spot before where we've entered a Final Four and there have been teams that are heavy favorites and there's been you know. Uh, a situation where it feels like two teams are on a collision course and then something something happens that changes that. Um I just I really I really don't I, I don't I don't see how it's not going to be UConn Purdue for the national championship. I Bama fans are, are going to throw that back in my face. NC State fans are going to throw it back in my face if if they pull off the upset as you should. Um but this is this is as lopsided of a, of two final four matchups as I can ever remember in my life. Um and the reason is because, one, what I just pointed out with NC State. Now, on the other side, here's your preview for UConn, Alabama. UConn is really fucking good. Really, 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 really fucking good. Alabama is, like, pretty good. So uh, there's your preview for that game. I think UConn's going to win that game because UConn. Uh, UConn's All-American, again. I'll say it again. I said it a million times last night. Here's a million and one. Their All-American guard went 0 for 6, and they won by 25 in the Elite Eight. Um so yeah, if we if we get the UConn Purdue matchup in the in the national championship, the the defending champion versus the defending loser of a sixteen versus one seed game last year, the national player of the year uh, against the defending champion and the best team all year, like it's the the storylines are there. In fact, they're so there that uh, Jake even pointed that out to the second Purdue won the game, we all like kind of dispersed out of the gambling cave and we we're just mingling around. And Jake just comes up to me with a big smile and he just goes. We got the storylines in Phoenix. Yeah. We got the storylines. He tweeted that already. Did he really? The storylines are coming. The storylines. Oh, my God. We got those fucking stories. But, yeah, Purdue-UConn, um, Klingon versus Edie is is going to be a hell of a matchup. Uh, I think I think UConn is, is considerably better than Purdue. I think, uh, you know, Edie, Edie's better than Klingon at the college level. Klingon's going to be a better pro. Klingon moves better. I think the one thing Edie does have an advantage on that, that – um, should be noted is that Edie played. Did he play 39 minutes? Did he play 40? I felt like he was out there the whole game. Yeah, he played 39 minutes today. Uh, Donovan Klingon's on. Maybe he's not anymore. But Donovan Klingon has not played a ton of minutes this year. Donovan Klingon does not. He it's it's rare for him to play a lot of minutes for UConn. Um, and he he was dealing with the foot injury, and I don't know how much of it is. Uh, you know they're 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 trying to 
to put him on a restriction so he doesn't hurt himself and how much of it is is him working himself back into game shape and all that. Um, but, yeah, if that matchup happens, that is something that, that – I think, like, in a vacuum, those two guys going up against each other, it makes a lot of sense that you, UConn will not have to double DD. They can trust Klingon to guard him. Again, you don't have to get stops every single time. Edie's going to get his here and there. But Klingon will provide enough resistance and, and force Edie into some tough shots and, and frustrate Edie a little bit. And those little baby hooks that Edie's just so used to rising up over everybody and, and having unobstructed views of the rim, suddenly he's going to have a hand in his face because he's got a 7-2 guy. Like, UConn has all the tools to guard Purdue. Their guard, like Stephon Castle, I assume is going to be guarding Braden Smith. Um, he, he, him, him on the point of attack for defense. He's he's insane the way he bottled up Terrence Shannon. Like this this UConn run that they've been on, they bottled up Boo Booey. They the uh, uh, the Blackman kid from Stetson. Like they he he's one of the best scorers in the country. He didn't have a great game against UConn. Um, Terrence Shannon. It's not just the team defense. It's like. UConn has gotten really, really good in this tournament run of the the individual scorers who can who can light it up. They have an answer for all of them. And now, if they were if they are to meet Purdue, they first have to meet Mark Sears, which is going to be interesting. So I guess we'll we'll get to see Castle guarding Mark Sears. Uh, but yeah, if they meet Purdue, what what makes it a little different is that Klingon is now going to be the guy guarding the the scorer, and Klingon is obviously a great defender. Um, but I his stamina, I, I would worry about like Zach Eady. It's not going to be a deal where like we're just, we'll just take Klingon out when Edie comes out because Edie might not come out if if Purdue gets the national championship they might just ride Zach Edie for forty minutes and and whether he's gassed or not it's just like he, you're our guy dude we gotta we're only going to go as far as as you take us um yeah so that's it Purdue Purdue onto the Final Four NC State joining them uh, I think all told as I look at it right now as I look at the bracket uh. It does feel a little insane to see NC State, Purdue, and Alabama in a Final Four, but we I, I've kind of gotten used to it. I mean, through the years, we've we've had a lot of teams that are, are newcomers to the party, and Purdue and NC State have been before, but it's been a very long time, and they're they're new to me. I, they've never been in my lifetime, so this is a new thing for me. Um, and I'm an old man. I, I feel very very old. I my knees crack when I every single time I get out of bed. So. There's your perspective for that. The, I, I have never seen either one of these two teams in the uh, Final Four, and they're here. Uh, Alabama's here. I, I think all told it's a great Final Four. I think it's perfect. I think if, if Duke was in the Final Four, um, there would be a little too much hate. Uh, I think I think Bama, Purdue, Duke, UConn is the most hateable Final Four of all time. Um, and I think having an NC State that America can rally behind is, is awesome. And I don't think it's going to go well. I don't think they're going to – uh, I think Purdue will will make short work of them, but I think having them there and having a lead up all week where we get to see interviews from DJ Burns, and uh, we get a we get to talk more about how Kevin Keats was almost fired, but then he won the ACC tournament and it, you know got a it got an automatic two year extension. All that stuff uh, will be very fun. So having having a team that everybody can root for in NC State uh, will be great. UConn, I, I'm still trying to figure out if people hate UConn, and I'm not doing that because I hate UConn. I swear to God. I have no problem telling you what teams I hate and which teams I don't. Um, I do not hate UConn, so I'm not saying this because I'm like trying to convince people to hate UConn. Um, I just, I just think it is interesting that that they're not hated. Like, it, 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 you know, Big East fans will disagree, and there probably are plenty of people that do hate UConn. But it's just crazy that, like, if Duke made the Final Four with the way the public feels about Zach Eady and watching watching Eady ball. Um, and with the way Alabama, like Nate Oates' perception publicly is is not great, the way he handled stuff last year, talking about wrong place, wrong time, and all that shit, and just kind of being blasé about a murder. Um, between those two and then Duke, we would have had a situation where UConn, the team that won the national championship last year and is rolling through the tournament this year, who is led by a coach who's an absolute maniac, psychopath, that tries to fight opposing fans, um, we would have had a situation where that was the team everyone was pointing to that was like, yeah, dude, those that's the team I'm cheering for to to win a national championship again, which is, you know, it's it's fine by me. I, I, I would probably be right there with you guys, but uh, it's just, like, crazy that that's – it's crazy that UConn's still likable, and I'm trying to, like, figure out why I love them and everyone loves them, even though we shouldn't. At what point – like, but that's kind of been every UConn team. Like, every UConn team – that goes on a run to a national championship, it seems like it's, like, fun and we all like them and they're, like, the new bloods and they're new to the party. Um, 
if they win this national championship, we as a college basketball community have to get serious about hating UConn. I think we have to. I think they, they will have won six national titles. And six national titles in 100 years is insane. Six national titles in 25 years. We have a crisis on our hands. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to enjoy this ride, but I think if UConn – wins a national championship this year, and especially if they do it like they did last year where they weren't really challenged at all. Um, I think we have no choice but to hate them, but also I don't know if you can really fake that. I think it just kind of has to come to you, and that's where I'm at with it. I, I But I was I was forecasting that as 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 the Purdue wins, uh, and I don't, think, I don't think people hate Purdue as a program. I think uh, people do hate Zach Eady. I find that very fascinating by the uh, way. That is... I, I watching watching the reaction online to Zach Eady and being in the room with like, like other barstool people and um, I mean he is he, everybody hates him around here but uh like not him as a person we've talked about it. it's not him as a person we just hate watching him shoot twenty fucking free throws a game and um just kind of what the Zach Eady games turn into um it is it is wild to see an athlete the perception from the layman and the perception from like the media type that get on TV and have the, I guess the, we, we need a new term for the, the old, what we used to call the blue checks on Twitter. Cause I don't know what you call those people anymore. Um, the, the big J's, I guess. Yeah. The big, yeah. Traditional media, the traditional media types, the gap between like how the public views Zach Eady and how they view Zach Eady. I, I can never remember an athlete in my life that, that was treated this way. We're like, it's not that it's not that people, think Zach Eady is um like it's not like people hate Zach Eady but have have no choice but to respect how good he is like people legitimately think he fucking sucks and that if the refs would just call fouls he would not even be able to he, he would foul out of every game within eight minutes and then all the people that are on tv are like this guy it, this guy might be better than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar I mean we've never seen a big man who can do the things he can do and uh that is like that is wild to win. it's wild to witness the divide. It, however, you consume media, uh, there is there is just a it, it, I, I've never seen a player be more polarizing than Zach Eady, um, which is why I, I I I somehow like live in the middle ground where I'm like the guy is awesome. He deserves every award he's going to win. Uh, I respect the hell out of him. Forty points and sixteen rebounds in an Elite Eight game is is all time stuff, and his jersey should hang in the Mackey Arena rafters. Having said all that. I do not enjoy watching his games. I do not enjoy watching him play. I do not enjoy his style of basketball. I do not enjoy the fact that Matt Painter, Matt Painter is one of the more brilliant offensive minds in the game of basketball, and I have to watch his team dump the ball down to the low post and draw a foul over and over and over again. I don't love it, um, but I respect Zach Eady and think he's a great player, and he, he seems like a good dude, even though uh, a little bit of manufactured adversity, I would say. A little bit of the, the post game, like everybody overlooks me. Um, you know, I... I don't. I don't know how true. I don't know how true that is. That everybody overlooks you, Zach. I mean, this is your second National Player of the Year award. I don't know. He kind of. He kind of. Uh, I feel like he should have saved that that press conference for the national championship. He he was kind of. Uh, I don't know if Rick Barnes did something to him or what, but he he went on a tirade about how people didn't recruit him coming out of high school and and all that. And uh, you know, at this point, I would say nobody's really overlooking you anymore. Uh. All right, I guess that's it. Um, fired up for the final four. I'm I'm not going out till Friday. I'm gonna do mostly sports from here, and then we're gonna fly out after that. So I don't know what the, uh, I don't know I, the, when when's the pump party that Rico. I, I I'm assuming Rico's on a flight out to Phoenix <laughs> tonight, and he's just gonna be there all week, and he's just gonna yeah. Um, I think the pump yeah. is Friday. Is it Friday Fri night? It's yeah. probably Friday. Yeah, cause I uh, I usually yeah I usually uh, like to get in on Wednesday, but we gotta we gotta do mostly sports from here, so I'm gonna get there a little late. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be an interesting Final Four. Uh, you have you have great players, obviously great teams. You have a Cinderella story, um, but it, it, it's a it's a good version of a Cinderella story where uh, I, I I I still really don't think NC State can win it all, but also. Fuck it. Why not? Why not just win two more if you're NC State? Uh, I I think they're going to have – if they have to – I mean, beating Purdue and UConn, which is probably what it's going to take, you're at least going to have to beat Purdue, obviously, uh, is a very, 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 very different beast than this this run that they've been on. Um, but, yeah, you at least have a Cinderella story where, yeah, they might get whoops in the Final Four, but it's not like, it's not like a George Mason 06 situation where – 
um, they're just gonna it, it, they're just gonna be outmatched from the start. And and you're like, why the hell did we allow this team to make it to the final four? At least I hope. Um, so yeah, th- this final four checks a lot of the a lot of the boxes. I love seeing new teams in the final four. It's I think it's awesome for the sport. I think it's awesome to Purdue fans have have been insane about Purdue basketball since 1980 anyway. So that doesn't really do much to like get more fans involved. NC State fans uh, kind of the same way, but having Bama in a Final Four is awesome. Um, I, th- I do think that's great for the sport that Bama fans are, you know, especially at a time when the Bama football program might take a step back. Uh, I think that's awesome for college basketball to have, to have like these new fan bases that uh, are, are are not only caring about college basketball, but just getting rabid about it and getting put in situations where um, they have a belief that, they, that they're going to win a national championship. That's, that's what the sport needs. Uh, also, one last stat that uh, uh, I saw everybody pointing out, and I, I want to be sure that um, I pointed out on this show because it does seem to be the stat that's circulating right now as the Final Four field is set. The Buckeyes were 2-0 and against the Final Four teams this year. Um, mm. Did the committee get it wrong? I don't know. Who's to say? Uh, but, yeah, it seems to be the stat that everyone's talking about. I, I Without actually looking up any other teams, um, I'm going to go ahead and guess we're the only team that have multiple wins over final four teams, but also zero losses. That's my guess. Um, All right. I think that's it. You got anything else, TJ? No. See you guys in Scottsdale. See you in, uh, yeah, we we staying in Scott. Where are we staying? Do you know? Scottsdale? I know that we have, there's a live, there's live events, Barstool live events this weekend in Scottsdale. We're in Scottsdale for those. All right. We'll come out to the, the Barstool live events. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be at the where we're, we're, I'm going to the games. I know Jake Marsh is going to the games. I don't know if Rico is or not. Um, I would assume no, because him and Dave on a live stream on Saturday is probably oh. inevitable. Oh, although we usually go to the games on Saturday. I don't know. Stay tuned. We'll yeah, out. stay tuned. We will figure it out. But uh, yeah, congratulations to uh, all these programs. This is cool to see. Uh, to, to, to see some programs that I've never seen in my life be be in the Final Four. And, uh, yeah, we're setting up for an all-time national championship um, between UConn and Purdue, but, you know, could be some surprises still in store. Um, I think I think Bama, Bama, UConn, Bama's path is they're just going to have to make everything, which, you know, in a dome stadium, at a football field, in a dome stadium with those backdrops, like I'm not really sure how much I love the idea of them doing that, and NC State is going to need to throw some shit against the wall and hope uh, DJ Burns just continues this run he's on. But uh, both of those things could happen. They're, they were they are within the realm of possibility, and they could disrupt the uh, the Klingon versus ED matchup in the national championship. But if they don't, and we do get that, uh, it's setting up to be an all time national championship. I'm fired up about it. Thank you to everybody that's uh, followed the show all the way up to this point in the tournament. We will see you all in Phoenix. Goodbye, everybody.